So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Root Solutions presentation for Creo Flow Analysis Extension. So as I said, this is a Root Solutions presentation, uh, ably assisted by, by PTC, and you just heard from Phil there. Um, we'll be taking you through this exciting new extension uh, this morning. Thank you for braving the, the elements out there. I know some of you uh, wouldn't have been able to get into the office, so I appreciate those of you that have arrived, um, and we'll do our best for you. So we're here to talk about Creo Flow Analysis. It's a brand new module that's been added to the, the already impressive portfolio of, of extensions and modules that we have within the Creo suite of products. This one in particular is, is very exciting for us. Um, I know from working with Root Solutions for quite some time that this is a product that lots of people have been asking for, we ourselves have been asking for, and now that it's finally here, we're, we're incredibly excited to show it off. When I saw this uh, uh, a month ago, um, yeah, really did uh, impress me. It's an incredible product. So uh, very pleased to be showing this off to you today. Just a couple of introductions. Um, I mentioned from Root Solutions, and this is our presentation. For those of you that aren't aware of Root Solutions, we are uh, one of the longest standing, I think we are the longest standing uh, PTC partner in the UK uh, over 25 years with the largest in the UK as well. Uh, my name's James Brooks. You may have met me before. I've been here for about 10 years, uh, both on technical and the sales side. Uh, and I'll be doing uh, the first part of the presentation today. And then um, we'll hear from Phil Darlington from PTC, uh, a technical fellow. I think he's been at PTC uh, for, forever. <laughs> he's been been there 20 plus years and uh, a bit of a applications and technical Goliath within PTC. We're very privileged to have him on board today and he'll be doing the hard work on the, the actual demonstration uh, for us. So yeah, looking forward to that. Bit of an agenda. So we're going to have a look at CFD and Creo Flow Analysis as a package. Uh, I'll just position it for you. We'll then have the demonstration um, and have a bit more of a chat about the package information, how this will be delivered to you, followed by uh, questions and answers at the end if we have time. Now, before we get too far into the presentation, um, I would like to just get you all up out of your seats and clicking some buttons uh, for a little interactive poll, really just so that we can gauge um, what kind of audience we have um, on, this, on this webcast today. We have huge attendance, actually. This is one of the largest webcasts we've done, which is brilliant. Um, and I just need to get a feel for what hats you wear in your roles within your companies. We have designers, engineers, and analysts. And I know that some of you put all of those hats on uh, in your day-to-day -day lives uh, in your work. So I'd like to just get a quick poll on that. And then the second question will be um, whether you have access to CFD software at the moment. So I'm just going to pop one of these on the screen now, question one. And if you could all answer, that would be fantastic. Um, so bear with me. OK. Wonderful. I can see all the responses coming in. This is great. Brilliant stuff. Just wait a few more seconds. Lovely. OK, and I'm just going to close the poll and then just share that poll for you. So we have uh, uh, quite a few designers and engineers and um, some analysts as well, which is good to see. Um, so thank you for doing that. Excellent. And then the second one I'll just run here is, do you have access to any of this software at the moment? So if you could all quickly pop your responses on there, that would be excellent. And a few more seconds. I'll just have a quick swig of coffee. <clears throat> Lovely. Lovely. And I'll just share those results. It's quite interesting on there. So over half of you have no CFD 
uh, capability at the moment. Um, uh, the clear winner there is, is obviously ANSYS on there too, which is interesting. Okay, wonderful. And that's the last thing I'll ask you to do, I promise, the rest of it's up to us. So with that in mind, um, I'll just take you through a few slides for positioning of this product. And the first one really is, is what is CFD? And if you look in the dictionary, it'll tell you that computational fluid dynamics or CFD is a branch of fluid mechanics that uses numerical analysis and data structures to solve and analyze problems that involve fluid flows. And as you saw from the poll there, there are software tools available at the moment that provide this virtual analysis for companies at the moment. Um, what we're gonna focus on is that these traditional third party packages, although capable, um, have quite a large disconnect with the design and development kind of uh, uh, department, certainly in the early phases of design and development. And it's this disconnect and this fracture in the process uh, that Creo Flow EFD targets um, and, uh, and provides solutions for. So that's what we're gonna look at. And obviously there's a few examples of, uh, of flow analysis. It comes in all sorts of different flavors and disciplines as well. So some of the challenges that are brought up by this disconnect um, can be, first of all, skills. Um, so we saw that the majority of you are designers and engineers. And when working with CFD, you do require, or well, traditionally with traditional tools, require specialist skills or training to drive these complex packages. They're very different to, to what you're used to. They're also extraordinarily expensive, um, which usually means that there's only a few licenses available in the workplace and, and a few analysts to drive them as well. Um, and this can obviously delay things and perhaps lead you not to use uh, the software as much as you'd like. The analysis tools themselves can be quite time consuming. And I don't mean that just from a, a straightforward kind of meshing and analyst point of view uh, or analysis point of view. It's, it's difficult to do and it does take time to produce, but also the process can be time consuming. Because of these systems being non-associative, there is exporting, cleanup, um, reapplication of conditions, and it, it can take a while to get these results back, which in the early phases could be quite challenging. And for those of you that don't have any flow CFD at all, so 50% of you, you can rely on physical prototypes. And traditionally, obviously, these will come later in the design process. You will have got quite a long way down uh, your design and development before you can create a physical prototype. And the results that come back from that obviously mean that if there is significant flaws, you may have to go back to the drawing board, which can have consequences. So a few of these consequences um, uh, from these challenges is that the inability to combine both your CAD and your CFD in an integrated and embedded way can mean that complex products are designed uh, or get quite a long way down the design route without accurate knowledge of fluid and airflow and how that's working inside those designs. And without that early design confidence, it's difficult to mitigate risk. Your results are sometimes found too late to, to really drive the design and drive the way that you're producing these parts. Um, when it comes late like that, you have less time, budget and resource to rework or redesign your products. So this lack of early analysis can result in late stage rework, scrap, and products that aren't quite as efficient or productive as they could be. If you don't have any analysis tools, then the cost of continually creating physical prototypes can delay and push budgets uh, uh, and push you over budget within your project. So some of the solutions to these challenges and these negative consequences will be to, and certainly this is where PTC have focused their attention, is to provide a solution that has total integration between your CFD and your CAD tool. And by doing this, we can support concurrent design analysis. You can work in tandem with these two products and use them to drive your design and development. If you're driving this earlier in your design process, it means that you can analyze more frequently with less delays. You can identify, identify, <laughs> identify flaws much easier and much earlier in the process to drive those key decisions in the way that your products are produced and improve product performance and function. 
what we're looking to do is bring CFD into the design and development process as a more integral part of that process driving these key decisions. Your virtual analysis will reduce the need to create physical prototypes, which again will reduce cost and reduce development time, and ultimately ward against product failure, your warranty and your liability risks should be mitigated. So with these solutions in mind, Creo Flow analysis was produced. And this is a solution that will allow designers, engineers, and analysts to simulate fluid flow issues directly within Creo. It's completely seamless between your CFD and your CAD, and it will allow you to integrate the analysis much earlier and much more often to understand your product function and performance. And when this product was being developed, there were some key requirements that were the areas of focus for this product. Number one, ease, number one, ease of use, the ability to have full embedded tight integration between these two different fields, the ability to create models. So by model creation, the setup of your analysis and make that very straightforward and very easy to do. We wanted to make sure that we have rapid simulation turnaround. So working, analyzing, getting those results back, reworking, that turnaround, that conversation needs to be extremely quick. And obviously all of this needs to be based on highly accurate results. I'm not gonna go through all of the um, objects on this slide. You will all get a copy of this presentation um, uh, in the following days. But just to pick up some key highlights of the capabilities of Creo Flow AFD that solve some of those requirements. Uh, first and foremost, ease of use. It's Creo. A lot of you use Creo every day. It's familiar. You know how to use the right hand mouse button. You know the menus. In addition to this, we have a single interface for the setup, simulation, and the post processing. Um, so it becomes extremely familiar and, and uh, uh, learning curves are extremely short. Because it's completely integrated and embedded, we are directly using the CAD data for your analysis. There's no translation, there's no cleanup prior to meshing. And because the data is completely associative, when you make changes to your model, it will update your analysis automatically. In terms of the model creation, the analysis setup, we start to employ things like templates so that we can speedily reuse the same kind of design uh, scenarios or analysis scenarios that you want to use frequently. And something that can't be overstated enough is the power, the speed of the automatic and efficient meshing. It is incredible. This is the thing that excited me the most when I saw this product. You'll see it during the demonstration. It's powerful, very, very powerful and works 100% of the time. I know that's a big boast. I haven't seen it fail once yet. It's incredible. In terms of the rapid simulation turnaround, this is all driven off a proprietary algorithm that speeds up runtime and convergence. And in pretty much all the benchmarks that we've seen, it uses half the iterations of our competitors. So a lot of you use ANSYS, we've seen, Star CCM. there's lots of other packages out there. We are extremely quick when it comes to producing the analysis. The mesher is completely integrated with the solver, which means there's no waiting around for the mesher and solver to converge. There's not a separate processing wait for the mesh and then a separate one for the solving itself. It's all at the same time. In terms of highly accurate results, because of the comprehensive physics that underpin this software, the quality of the mesh that we're creating, we have incredible stability when it comes to working with complex geometry or applying extreme conditions. So yeah, we're pretty confident about this product and it is excellent. In terms of the way that we deliver this product to you, it's going to come in three flavors. We have Creo Flow Analysis, Creo Flow Analysis Plus, Creo Flow Analysis Premium. So the flow analysis, uh, sorry, the entry level Creo Flow Analysis um, provides simulates flow, heat transfer, and turbulence. This offering for an entry-level package is actually richer in functionality than a lot of the other entry-level modules that are out there. Certainly, um, our competitors don't offer this level of functionality with the, the, the entry-level product. And it's very much a good, better, best scenario in terms of the functionality, totally scalable, um, and it caters for every level of application, whether you're an analyst, whether you're a designer, 
and also in terms of the analysis types that you want to perform, we have all the bases covered. So the analysis plus module adds particle radiation species and moving sliding meshing. And then for your more exact, exotic types of analysis, we have cavitation, multi-phase, multi-component and dynamics as well. If you don't know what some of these things are, then uh, we have a little translation down the bottom of here for you. And again, this, work, this presentation will be supplied to you after the, uh, after the presentation. Okay, so now we know why the product exists, what challenges it's, it's been designed to solve and how the package is product, uh, uh, packaged sorry, and put together. I'll uh, be quiet and I'll hand over to Phil who will be able to show you how this product works, which is what I'm sure you're all keen to see. If you bear with me, I will just hand over to Phil. All yours, Phil. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Certainly can. Great. Okay, dokie. On to the technical presentation then. There are four example use cases that I want to present to you today. One is a cyclone flow analysis. Um, this is an internal analysis where we're looking at the flow inside an assembly of components. The next is the inverse of this. We're going to look at an external flow analysis and how rather than gar gathering all of the domain inside an assembly, we look at everything outside of the model. Moving on, <clears throat> we then look at a couple of more complex scenarios. One is the heat transfer inside of an electronics assembly here and how the airflow can interact with the heat that's being dissipated by the solid components and uh, how we can go and look at some optimization of that assembly to give us the best results for heat transfer. And finally, let's look at, instead of the first three, looking at airflow, let's look at some fluid flow and how that would work in the context of a pump. So moving on to the first scenario here, I have my cyclone and the first thing I want to draw your attention to is we're working inside of Creo. This is my assembly. I have three components in my assembly and if I want to go ahead and analyze them, I go up to my flow analysis button here. So it's just another button on the ribbon, totally integrated with Creo. It's not a uh, it's not an external product. The first thing I do is create a new project and you'll notice that we have a specific model tree specific to the CFD env environment and the things I need to do here, four key areas, physics, domains, boundary conditions, results. Physics, I need to tell it what sort of physics we're going to employ, so what sort of equations we're going to use in our calculations and the basic uh, equations that I need to go and run this are for looking at turbulence, and also showing the results, which is the streamline. When I go and add these physics equations in here, you'll see that they get populated into the model tree. So I know which physics I'm going to be using. Next, I need to tell it where I'm going to be applying those equations to. So let's go and specify a domain. I just picked the extents of this assembly at the moment. And what it does is it automatically finds the holes at the end. It will fill those, those holes up and they will th that will then become my domain. If I turn the CAD models off, what you can see is this is a copy now of the basically the fluid part and it gets added as an extra part into my model tree. Let's go back to the analysis model tree. You can see that this is my domain. I've got the new part in there. So the next thing I need to do is start to look at the boundary conditions for this. You can see automatically it found two boundary conditions. It knew that it had holes at the end. So for ease of visualization, if you've got a complex model with many boundary conditions, you can go and rename these. So I'm going to rename them as one underscore in, one underscore out. I use the, the ones prior to the name because then it, it um, reorders them to the top of the boundary conditions tree there. So by default, this is a solid wall. I don't want it to be a solid wall. I want it to actually have a specified inflow here of five meters per second going normal to the boundary and I'm also going to say release some particles so this is analogous to releasing some smoke in a wind tunnel in a wind tunnel the smoke wouldn't affect the actual flow of the wind it would simply aid the visualization of what's happening and that's exactly the same here for the exit I'm going to use a specified pressure of 101325 that's one atmosphere in pascals so I specified my 
physics that I'm going to use, the domains, the boundary conditions. Let's go and look at the material. By default, we always default to air. And since this is air in this circumstance, there's no need to change this. You can see we've got a raft of other um, materials that we could go and use. If you have a material that's specific to your application, let's say um, you want to look at blood and blood injection, or you, you have some other fluids that you know the characteristics of, it's a simple text file that you can go and change. Very quickly, I meshed the model here. I'm going to put a section through this model now, just so you can see the sort of meshing we do. By default, we do bricks. If the bricks cannot match the geometry closely enough, according to the resolution that we've asked it to use, what it will do is on the boundary of that brick, it will put some tets on there. Let's just hide off the section now and put on a full mesh on the part. You can see that these are predominantly bricks and what we try to do, the reason we try to use bricks is they solve incredibly quickly. The other thing I hope you noticed there was the speed with which we created that uh, mesh in the first place. This is running real time. I've recorded this just so I don't have any any pauses during the simulation and during the presentation. We've now run that simulation. That's how quickly it took to run. This is this is a live recording, or if, the, if you can have such a thing, it's run at real time, I should say, the recording. So there's no smoke and mirrors, cutting and editing here. This is all run real time. We can see the sorts of variables that we want to display in the flow here, and I'm going to ask it to display the pressure. We can then change the line thicknesses and add some animation here. And what this will show us is this will show us a three-dimensional flow through this cyclone assembly. Admittedly, when you see a lot of colors on top of each other like this, it's not always the easiest way to go and visualize. So something we can do is go and add a section view again. So let's go and pick on that section I used before where we were looking at the mesh, change the direction of that section, put it in the Z plane, and say that, they, that the variable that I want to display here is once again going to be the pressure. So now we can see very clearly at a specific location within the assembly what the result is going to be. So whilst you've got the three-dimensional effect of the flow running around the assembly, we've got a two-dimensional graphic showing us precisely what's happening at a precise location. So if I bring this section up now just through the inlet here, we can see how we've got the high pressure coming in. But then interestingly, we get the low pressure on the inside of the cyclone there and then high on the outside. So this is this is like a river running around a bend where on the outside of the bend it's running fast on the inside it's it's it, or on the outside I should say it's going to be running slow on the inside it's running fast so you can see how we get the different pressure build up as we're moving around and then interacting with the additional material that's flowing in from clockwise direction there so now what I'm going to do is show an iso surface and the iso surface what this is showing is areas that have similar or identical um, properties. So if I say that I want to see everywhere with a specific pressure value, it will show everywhere within the cyclone that has that same pressure. And you can see there, for example, that we had a, a location where it was a high pressure just on the corner of the inlet and that married up to the high pressure on the other side of the cyclone going around. Once again, I'm highlighting here the sorts of variables that I can show and we can see that but I can't go and show heat at the moment. So if I want to see that, I can drop that in as an additional module. I've just rerun the, uh, the analysis again. And if we now go and look down the list of variables, you'll see that heat is available to us. So here is temperature. And we can now see the temperature. If we look at the little icons on the right here just zooming into them at the moment we can see that the heat differential between the inlet and the maximum temperature they're about the same but we're only running at five meters per second so let's go and increase this to 50 meters a second now these are the sorts of what if calculations that you would only be able to make if you had a physical prototype and you had the correct sensors in there and we can see that if we make this a tenfold increase we actually get nearly a two and a half degree temperature rise inside this assembly so we, that was a tenfold increase let's double it once again and see what the temperature increase so this isn't tenfold increase this is a doubling and we can see that that temperature increase now is 10 degrees so this is really running on a parabola the more we go and increase the through flow the more quickly the increase in temperature so this is a sort of what if type simulation and analysis that we can do up front that you wouldn't be able to do unless you actually built some physical prototypes and actually went and censored them and put some 
um, sensors into that assembly to actually find out what, we, what was happening. So let's go on to the next scenario now. And the next module that I, or the next model that I want to look at is an external analysis. This is a UAV, an unmanned aerial vehicle, a drone, if you like. <laughs> and, and a couple of things to draw your attention to. It's an assembly, but we have two different wing profiles. The left and wing here are actually two different wing profiles. Let's jump into the flow analysis. Once again, you can see it's just right there on the ribbon. I keep emphasizing this. This is the specific model tree with the four key areas, physics, domains, boundary conditions, results. Let's go and tell it what the area is that we're going to analyze. And this time, instead of picking internal stuff, I'm going to pick all of the components in this assembly. So you can see that this is a fairly detailed assembly here. I'm going to add those into my domain. And then what I'm going to do is say that this isn't going to be an internal analysis you can see all the domains are added in there but instead this isn't going to be an internal analysis this is going to be an external analysis and you can see by default here the mesh location is interior so i'm going to switch this around to exterior and it will also want to know how large the working environment is so how big is the rest of the world and that's something that we specify here by saying that we want to stick a bounding box around it that's 50 percent bigger than the actual size of the model itself. So let's go and generate a mesh here. Again, this is running real time. So it gives you a good idea of how quickly we can generate the mesh here and how accurately we can do it also. So you can see it generates a significant number of binary splits. This is where it's breaking down the elements to see how many elements it needs to start off with. Once it's gone through those binary splits, it creates the cells and then determining or determined by how accurately those cells actually map around the geometry decides whether or not it caps it off with with uh, the actual brick face or whether it uses a tech face instead to more closely map around the CAD geometry. geometry. So here are all the components. You can see the meshing that it's created. And these are the outside or the extents of the world within which this drone is going to be flying. So first thing we want to do is add some boundary conditions. You see we've got six sides to our cube and on that front face of our cube, we want to go and assign a specific um, inlet speed. We can't do that at the moment until we've told it what physics we're going to employ. You can see that that's now in our model tree. So when we come back to the front face now you can see we get the option to go and add in the flow type according to the types of equations that we want to be used in the, in the calculation so i'm going to say this is a specific velocity heading into this front face here and i'm going to say 600 miles an hour which in meters per second terms is 268 meters per second so for the other five faces very easily, I can just go and pick all six of them like this, use the shift button, use the control button to drop out that front face. And then I'm going to say that we're going to have a specified outlet pressure and that this outlet pressure is going to be drawing along in a specific direction. And this is towards the tail of the plane, which is a minus 268. So the same speed again um, towards the back of the plane and running out of the side walls of this box. Next thing is I want to do, release these smoke particles so we can actually visualize how this is running. I don't want to just release smoke everywhere because then it becomes a little claustrophobic. We can't see what's going in, on it, in there. Everything's covered up. So I'm going to say just use the wings and the nose to release sm smoke particles. Now I've set the calculation running. Even though it hasn't finished running, we can start to get an idea of what is actually happening inside this analysis. Let's just go and turn off the outsides of the box here. So turn off the outline just to, for the ease of clarity. And we can see that we've got the flow lines here at the moment. These will continue to be refined as the calculations progress, but we can start to visualize them up front very early. So I'm going to ask it to display the pressure here. 
And if you look on the model tree, as I click the refresh, those values are changing. So here is the max and min value for that pressure. And we have this refresh button. So as it continues to refine and make these results better, so these values will start to converge. So you can see that we initially on the right hand side had this little tail that was sticking up in the air from this flow line. And as it starts to refine, that will settle down and we'll start to get rid of that. Let's change the line thickness and start to animate this at the same time. And I told you about the two wings, the left and right are not symmetrical. That's because the one on the left is an idealized wing. It's got the aerofoil shape, but it hasn't been bent around a camber line, which is what you would ordinarily do for a wing profile. The one on the right has been bent around the camber line. So what's the difference if we go and examine these more closely? I can actually say that on the wing, I want to see that specific variable. I want to go and see the pressure load on that wing. So let's turn off the CAD bodies now so that we can see that more clearly. And you can see, see here quite clearly that we have a low pressure on the top. So we've got suction on the top and high pressure on the bottom. So this is doing what the wing should do. And if we turn on the flow lines, you can see that the flow lines match what is happening on the wing. The colors of the flow lines are the same as what is happening on the physical body. Compare and contrast this now to the wing on the left where when I turn on the total pressure for that, you can see that this is symmetrical because what I haven't done here is actually bend the aerofoil shape around the camber line for, the, uh, for making a true aero surface. And again, the streamline information that we get here reflects what is happening. And similarly, when we're looking at a front view, you can see how the trails of the flow line drop off to that side on the right wing. Now what I can do is use a section view. This is really interesting because when we put the section view through the wing and turn it to pressure, you can see that again, we've got this symmetrical situation where we have no lift on the wing on the left and, and compare and contrast this to the right, we can see very clearly that through this section here, we've got the low pressure on the top, the high pressure on the bottom, showing that we're quite clearly going to get lift on this right hand side. OK, so let's have a look at the next scenario now. And the next one I want to look at is the electronics componentry. A couple of things to consider here before we go into the presentation. One is the domains. Up to now, you've seen two fluid domains, an internal and an external. What I'm now going to show you is the interaction between different domains. We're going to have a fluid domain that's going to be the air running through the grill at the back and then being pushed out through the four slots on the left hand side here uh, and then these are going to interact this airflow is going to interact with these solid components so the solid components are going to have maybe thermal properties and thermal characteristics and we want to see the interaction between these two so this is introducing another area of equations or another group of equations which are going to be the thermal equations here so let's go and see how this works in reality once again, go into our application, say a new project, we get the normal model tree, and I'm going to specify the domain in which we're working. So I'm going to pick the front and rear faces here. And you can see that we've got a couple of solid components. We've got the two buttons on the left and the socket and the switch here, which we want to remove because when we go and create that solid domain for the airflow, we don't need those switches incorporated. So that's the fluid domain. Now I want to go and add the solid components and I just pick these from the regular model tree here. Go and pick all of those and add those in as solid components. Go back to the flow environment and now I can tell it the equations that I want to employ in the calculations. So I'm going to be using heat as well here. Next thing that's interesting is the materials. By default, it picks all of the materials from the solid components. If they're already pre-specified, these will get populated into um, the domains here. Onto these domains, I need to add some boundary conditions. So two lots of boundary conditions are going to be employed. One is going to be heat coming out from a heat source from the chip that's inside here. And I'm going to say that's, that's a five watt heat source. And also, I'm going to tell it that I want to track this heat source in an XY plot. So let's go and pick XY plot there. 
So we're going to have boundary conditions for the chip, and then we're going to have boundary conditions for the airflow as well. And the airflow is going to flow in through the backside, just using normal atmospheric pressure. So I'm going to say this is going to be a specified inlet pressure where we're going to release the particles because we want to simulate that airflow coming through. And at the front side, we're going to have an outflow of 0 0.001 cubic meters. So let's go and generate the mesh now. This movie, I have had to say, has been edited, so I have sped that one up a little there, so we didn't see the true time that it takes to calculate that, but it's, it's not too long at all. It, it really is quite quick. The thing I'm going to do now is highlight these are the interaction surfaces between the solid and fluid mesh, and you can see that it creates this additional surface between the two areas that are going to be calculated, so between the fluid and the solid. So let's turn on our XY plot now and go and run this problem. And the thing that you will see when we click on the plot is that we start off at 300 degrees. This is our default temperature. This is running in Kelvin. So we start off at 20 degree, 27 degrees, and we actually increase up to about 390 before dropping into a steady state of somewhere around the 345 degree mark. So what would be nice to analyze now is exactly what's going on inside the assembly and how the airflow is actually moving around inside here. So let's go and animate the airflow. Let's go and turn off the outside here so we can see a little bit more clearly what's going on inside. Let's just turn off the wireframe there. And what I can do here is go and select all the interaction surfaces between the solids and the fluids and say that we want to visualize here the temperature of these components and quite clearly we can see the interaction between the chip the heat sink that it's connected to and its effect upon the other components we can see that even more clearly by adding a section view here so let's once again show the temperature and you can see how the air flow comes in cool and then it's starting to draw the heat out of that heat sink there Let's use an ISO surface once again to try and find common areas of, of temperature. And you can see as I move that along, you can see how we can find areas like this that are all sharing the same sort of temperature. And we can see here how that temperature is being drawn up from the heat sink and out into the air there. Let's now see the effect of doubling the throughput on this particular fan. So let's rerun this. And what you can see here is that we start off at 300 once again. Last time we got to a steady state of around 345. Now you can see that we're dropping down to around 325. So by doubling the throughput, we've managed to reduce the temperature of that heat sink by about 20 degrees. So we've not got, had to go into hardware prototyping here. All within software, we found that let's change the fan and let's perhaps increase the lifespan of this particular component because we've had to we've been able to bring the temperature down while it's while it's actually in its in its working condition of of uh, five degrees of five watts power consumption let this run all the way through to its end here because we want to see if that is actually the worst condition and something i'm going to do here which i don't do in any others is i'm actually going to make a change to the geometry after this and this is similar in a way to james mentioned the fact that we can have templates so we can save off information about how a model should be configured and this is a similar sort of thing to what i'm going to be doing here because i'm going to make a change to the geometry come back in and even though the geometry has changed the template understands how it should be applied to that geometry doesn't have to be reapplied. I don't have to redefine all of the materials, for example, the boundary conditions, that sort of stuff. It, it updates automatically. So that's simulation completed there. And we can see that that ended up with a steady state of around that 425, uh, uh, sorry, 325. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's now leave the flow analysis environment and now make a change to the geometry. I'm going to use some flex modeling here. So if this is imported geometry, doesn't matter we can still go and make a change to it using our flexible modeling and you can see here that it automatically picks up that I have a pattern of slots in the back here and I'm going to say that I want to change that pattern to have an additional slot at the bottom so we now have seven here 
and I'm going to identify these two cuts here as being cuts and specify that I want to pattern these with respect to this direction and that I want to have two in that pattern with an offset of 5.5 millimeters. So the geometry has been updated. Let's go back to the flow analysis and see what the impact is here. First of all, I want to go and update the information that's being used in this project. I will have to just tell it once again where the holes are in the mesh. So I tell it where the front two buttons are. And uh, the socket and switch at the back. So just remove those out. So we're just updating the mesh. Everything else is updated for us. So we don't have to reapply any of the boundary conditions. Don't have to go and tell it what's happening with the with the uh, boundary conditions for the chip. Let's go and examine what happens when we run the analysis. And interestingly here, you would think that giving us a better airflow coming in through the back of this container, we'd actually get a lower temperature. This is certainly what I thought when I was making this change. But in reality, you can see that instead of getting 325 or dropping below 325, we've actually gone closer to 330. So we've actually increased the temperature slightly. And the reason for that is because those extra two slots have been placed down by the motherboard. So instead of the airflow flowing up through the heat sink, the airflow flow is now being directed closer to the motherboard and not drawing the temperature out as efficiently as we would have done previously. So again, just a great example of how upfront software prototyping can give you a real insight into what's going to be happening in the physical world before you go and start to build your physical prototypes. So the next scenario I want to look at here is the one using fluid. So the three we've looked at up to press have been generally airflow going through these components. So air around the air through the um, vortex, air around the outside of the drone, air flowing through the electrics. This is going to be fluid flow through the pump. So once again, you can see it's an assembly that we're working with here. We've got patterns of nuts and bolts, etc. So I'm going to go into my analysis, create the new project. Once again, you know, the four key areas, physics, domains, boundary conditions and results. Let's go and tell it the physics we want to employ. I want to look at the turbulence. I want to look at the heat and the streamlines that are going to be flowing through here. Next thing, let's go and specify where these equations are going to be acting upon. So the domains here, and I'm specifying the end faces of my domain, and then we can see all of the holes in those end faces. So if I have holes that are not required, I can just pick them here and remove. So you can see I've also got some bolts on this right hand face so I'm not interested in the holes there so let's just pick all of those and remove those and these are the three holes that are going to be specifying the ends of my domain you can see that the domains an additional model in the model tree let's turn off the CAD bodies and this is my fluid domain I now need to split this into three components because we've got a rotating part and we have two static parts so this is separating the inlet from the static part on the right and then the static part needs to be broken in two because we've got the internal rotors or the rotating part and then we've got the external involute so i can give those names as a as i actually save these off so i'm going to call that the rotary part and this the static part as you can see i have actually speeded this movie up by about 25 percent so just to give you an idea when it actually goes into the meshing so let's go and pick the parts that are going to be used as my fluid domains and those are these three components so you can see by default the cell size is 0 0.0007 i'm going to reduce this cell size to get give us a very accurate mesh so this is running real time plus about 25 percent so again gives you a good idea though of how quickly we can mesh and how quickly we can create not just the mesh but a very good mesh a very refined mesh with a minimum cell size of 0 0.0003 that's relative size to the CAD model so let's just uh, take a look at this rotary component here and if I go and turn on the the mesh for this and zoom in you can see we have a particularly fine mesh on the boundary now and what we're doing now is we're actually 
employing a rotary component into our analysis. This isn't just a static. So if I go and pick up on the rotary portion, I'm going to say this is going to be using non-inertial frame. There are two ways of doing this. Non-inertial frames, a quick way of doing the analysis. The other one is to actually remesh and uh, and use something called a rotary mesh. So the axis that we're going to be rotating around here is the y-axis. So let's put that to one. And then all of the materials that are going to be flowing through here are going to be water. So let's change all of these to water now. And now let's tell it the boundary conditions. We can see these are highlighted here. This is going to be an outflow of a specific flow rate. And I'm going to say that the flow rate I want from this pump is 0.1 cubic meters a second. And that, that's going to be the outlet. The other end is just going to be default air pressure acting on the outside and that's going to be releasing the smoke particles so we can actually see the effect of that i've just hit the run button and the calculation clearly hasn't finished yet but immediately i'm able to start to visualize what is happening with the flow going through here let's change the line thickness and animate this flow and then go and pick a variable that we actually want to see i'm going to say that i want to see the pressure And we can see, as we did with the cyclone, that we have a lot of information going on here. So we can we get a fairly good idea of what's actually happening. But employing a section here will make, well, give us a level of clarity that perhaps we weren't able to get when we have so much information thrown at us at the same time. So let's once again go and turn on the pressure. And it's interesting to see here how you get the drop off from the pressure from one blade rising up to the next. And again, you can see. We have the extremes of the values, and as I continue to hit refresh, so this gets refined and improved as the calculation continues to run. So let's turn that section off for a minute and go and look how the, uh, how the pressure actually affects this rotating component. And if we could put the section on at the same time, put it on in the other direction, you can see how they have the same values, but we're simply viewing those results in a different way. So here is, is the flow going through the assembly, looking at the part or looking through the section. We're looking at the same information, the same numbers, but we're just flowing them. Well, we're just flowing them. We're just looking at them in a different way. Let's use an ISO surface now because I think these often give us a lot more clarity on what's actually on in the model here. And if I start to look for the pressure variable once again and move and change the value of the pressure that I'm looking for this highlights once again how we get the pressure rising between each of the blades as this thing rotates around and you can see quite clearly the distinction between one side and the other particularly when we get to the top of the blade okay let's turn the ISO surface off now. So just turn that off. Once again, looking at the section there. And this time, instead of looking at the pressure, what I'm going to do now is an examine of, examination of the temperature. And again, what we can see by the little graphic here is that we have a temperature variable of roughly zero, well, 0.7 of, de of a degree. That's the difference between the inlet and the outlet temperatures. I'm now going to really crank this up. Instead of doing 100 radians a second, I'm going to turn it up to 500 radians a second. And we can see that we've got, again, a little bit of increase here in the temperature. Well, a little more, more than a little bit. We've gone up to about a 35 degree differential between the inlet and the exhaust pressure. Again, ch change the parameter that we're looking at on the cross section, and you can see that once again, we have the same results looking on the section as we have flowing through the assembly itself. And what I'm showing you here is if we go and look at the XY plot, you can actually see that while this analysis was running, the point at which I went and changed the uh, the inlet rate, well, not the flow rate, but the actual speed of rotation of that uh, 
of that moving component. So you can see that around the 340 mark, I went and increased the rotation rotation rate of that particular component from 100 to 500 radians. And uh, you can see then all of the results that it was calculating, the pressure, temperature, turbulent energy, turbulent kinetic energy, velocity, etc. All of those jumped up on the XY plot to show us how all of this calculation is being run live and dynamic. So you don't have to wait to the end of the calculation to find out what is actually happening in your assembly. Very early in the process, you get a pretty good idea of what is happening because you can see as it starts to approach, it, approach this steady state. So just to run over the packages again, um, you have this good, get, this good, better, best uh, type of approach where for the first two packages, we were looking at the Creo flow analysis and we have the Creo flow analysis plus for the next two. So if we look here, the cyclone flow and the drone analysis, there we were employing the Creo flow analysis standard functionality. Looking at the heat transfer, so the interaction between the airflow and the solid components, there we were employing the radiation information and also similarly with the um, with the pump at the end there, seeing how increasing the speed of the impeller there actually increased the temperature of the fluid inside. So we're also looking at radiation there. In terms of what the premium product can add, and it does add an awful lot, particularly if, you, if you're looking at critical flow characteristics, such as cavitation. If you're looking at medical applications and you want to avoid getting bubbles into the bloodstream, etc. If you're looking at props like we have here, so you want to avoid getting um, cavitation behind your props, um, that's certainly something you'll want to be employing. If you want to mix fluids together, multi-phase, multi-components, multiple gases of different densities, and also dynamics, fluids and solids interactions, you'll want to be looking at your, your premium flow analysis product. As much as I wanted to show you today, I realize we're, we're now at uh, 10.27, oh, sorry, 10.23, so we've got about seven minutes left now for Q&A. If anybody does have any questions, if you'd like to type them into uh, the question panel, then we'll be able to address them for you. That's great. Thanks, Phil. Superb. Right, I will just take control back on here. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen now. Phil, just give me a double check on that. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, your, your screen's fine there. Yep. Wonderful. Um, so, yeah. Do we have any questions? I know there was a couple that popped up. You know, I didn't put uh, all of the above option in my poll. Apologies for that. Okay, one of the questions here. Instead of having a constant flow, can you simulate a varying flow, i.e. a single or looped human breath? You can have a variable flow, yes. What you can do is you can assign a table, which, well, you can do it in, in two ways. One, you can say you've got an initial steady state, and then what it will end up as. And so that's one way of de determining the variation. The other one is to do it from a table. A follow on question. Is there any limitation on speed of external flow, say as we approach supersonic speeds? I'm not sure on that one. I, I don't know. I have to I have to confess that I'm this is a relatively new product. And, well, I've been using it a couple of months now. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, but it's certainly something that we can find out and get back to you. Are you, are you logging these, James, or is it? Something? Yeah, they're all logged. If you're logging your questions via the, the, the menu, then uh, answers will all be given. And, uh, and we'll make sure that everybody that's attending will get a copy of those. Yeah, so supersonic. I'm, I'm, I do apologize. I don't know the answer to that. Okie dokie. <clears throat> what specification of computer was being used? So these were all run on my Dell. 6800 which is a 2.7 gigahertz i7 uh i have got 32 gig of ram on there all the demonstrations apart from the one of the airflow of the electronics all of those recordings were done in real time so you know it should give you a pretty good idea of just how quick the meshing and solving is 
Question from Rod. Uh, how do you deal with boundary layers? What do you mean by boundary layers? Do you mean the interface between solids and fluids? I don't know. <laughs> that's all that's in the question. I think that's one that we'll, we'll answer uh, uh, after the event. OK. Any integration to wind chill for the meshes and conditions? <coughs> so there are two files that get generated. At the moment, these are independent files which will get attached to the assembly as secondary content. content. Those files are the project files. So in the same way that we have, we talked about templates, when that information gets reassigned to the geometry, that's in something that we call a project. That project can get saved off as a separate file. As the calculations are running, we also generate a results file. So the project and the results files at the moment get tied together as secondary content. And I know that that was a discussion that we had when we went on training a couple of months back. I, well, a couple of in our group asked the same thing where will the results reside and there is a discussion about whether they will remain a secondary content or whether it will actually get stored in with the model but at the moment it's secondary content okie dokie um did any experimental correlations done for some simplified cases oh, i don't think i read that well no. yes so i think what you're referring to here so so if you look at um simulate obviously the old Mechanica product as it used to be referred to, we had simulation models within that. And it, within the help guide of simulate, you can actually go what has been used to verify, whether it be by calculation, comparison to um, competitors' products or empirical testing, what has been used to verify those models. We do in the same way have verification models for, uh, for the fluid analysis, I'm just trying to think of the, the acronym we actually call it nowadays, the FEA product, the fluid, fluid analysis extension. We do have these verification models for this also. Excellent. Uh, how well does the mesh algorithm tackle small gaps? Brilliantly. And I, and I don't say that tongue in cheek there. Um, on the cyclone assembly, where the cyclone, where the inlet comes into the side body there you actually get this this tangency condition where it's difficult to go and mesh because you get something that's meeting with a well eventually the angle runs out to zero and if you use a fairly coarse mesh it finds it can't actually put the mesh into that location so what does it do it just builds the smallest element size it puts around the area that it can't do so like it, let's say it was a jump check something like that and it just leaves that very small volume missing so it would be the smallest brick size the minimum brick size it just leaves out if you want to go and get it to match more closely well you can reduce the brick size and that's what i show people in, in demonstrations i can reduce the brick size and then suddenly that omitted brick that we had before is included and so the jump check that was originally excluded by virtue of the fact that we had a brick around it is suddenly included so I've yet to see it fail on any geometry. I have to say it's quite spectacular in the way that it manages and the, um, any, any erroneous ge geometry. And the way the guy described it uh, from Cimerics was if you can shade the model, basically you can mesh it because it uses bricks for the most part. If when it gets the brick and it starts to intersect the geometry, if it can't make its own geometry, and it's struggling to do anything, what it does is it uses the shaded triangles or the shading triangles to actually cap off the bricks. So essentially, if you can shade it, you can mesh it. Fantastic. Super stable meshing. There's obviously a lot of interest. We've got a lot of questions coming in, but we are, I've got one eye on the time here. We're, we're about to run out of time. Um, so thank you for all your questions. We will answer all of them, I promise. A um, uh, couple of questions that I can cover off quickly. When is it available? It's available right now in Creo 4. Um, latest release and uh, yeah we'll uh, we'll certainly make sure that we get a copy of all of these questions back to you um, uh, yeah a few people uh, still they're still rolling in so as I do my summary and, uh, and close then um, uh, we'll make sure we get back to you on these if you have any more questions or you suddenly think of some email them through to us we'll happily get back to you on all of this so just to to close things down then to to summarize it all Creo Flow Analysis Extension, super easy to use, massively capable, scalable product, 
available. Uh, the entry level product comes in a locked or a floating um, license. All of these are obviously subscription based. Um, the the, the uh, plus and the premium package are floating on there as well. So that's something to, uh, to remember. But in terms of the uh, product itself, what we're looking to do is to start incorporating CFD much earlier in your design process. And as you've seen from the demonstrations today, it's incredibly quick, incredibly accurate, and uh, hopefully a welcome addition to your design and development processes. Thank you all very much for attending. Uh, really appreciate it. We've had a massive turnout. It's great to see. And uh, if you do want to get in touch with us about any of this or you have any other further questions, you can contact us at rootsolutions.co.uk. You can email the sales team at root-solutions.co.uk or you can give us a ring. So from myself and Phil and the rest of the guys at Root Solutions and PTC, thank you for watching. Really appreciate it and hope to speak to you all soon. Thank you for attending. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.